Hello, it's Monday, September the 5th. I'm Hwang Jie and this is Business Daily Live from Seoul. Also on the program, Korea's busted Hanjin shipping has reportedly filed for bankruptcy protection also in the United States just days after turning to receivership in Korea. And hopes are high for local players to lead in the budding ultra-high-definition global TV market as Korean researchers develop core technologies for broadcasting. Korea's largest shipping company, Hanjin Shipping, has applied for bankruptcy protection in the U.S. The Korean government launched a special task force to deal with the possible impact on the country's maritime sector. Kim Jong-soo starts us off. Hanjin Shipping has reportedly filed for bankruptcy protection in the U.S. at a court in Newark, New Jersey. The Wall Street Journal says the application was filed last Friday, just two days after the company applied for protection in Korean courts. The filing, once approved by the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, will prevent creditors from seizing Hanjin's U.S. assets and block them from launching further legal action while the company undergoes restructuring in Korea. The report says the U.S. bankruptcy filing was made by Seok Tae-su, Hanjin's inside director and foreign representative. The company currently operates over 60 regular lines worldwide, with a fleet of 140 container or bug vessels. The Wall Street Journal says Hanjin's bankruptcy will be regarded as, quote, the largest container shipping failure in history, dwarfing all previous carrier bankruptcies. Meanwhile, the Korean government set up a special task force on Sunday to cope with potential disruptions in maritime trade and the economy as a whole caused by Hanjin's recent difficulties. According to the Financial Services Commission, Hanjin Shipping currently owes over 64 billion won, or 58 million U.S. dollars, to a combined 457 contracted companies. Hanjin's possible delays in transport and satisfying its financial obligations could create problems for their operations as well. The government task force will also instruct Hanjin Shipping to apply for prohibition of seizure orders in 43 countries, to further minimize the risk of creditors taking Hanjin's vessels. It will also deploy teams to Korea's five major ports in Busan, Ulsan, Tongyang, Changwon, and Mokpo to quickly identify and respond to problems arising in the shipping sector. Kim Jong-soo, Business Daily. Another record high for Korea's foreign exchange reserves. The Bank of Korea says the amount reached roughly 375.5 billion U.S. dollars as of the end of last month, up around 4.1 billion from July. The central bank attributes the increase to gains from investment in foreign assets and the rise in the value of non-dollar currencies. As of the end of July, Korea stood as the world's seventh largest holder of foreign exchange reserves. China topped the list, followed by Japan and Switzerland. Korea's top financial regulator is considering lowering the threshold for a stock market listing even if the company's business performance is far from stellar. At a press conference discussing financial reform today, Financial Services Commission Chairman Im Jong-yong said he's working on creating a new standard that considers a company's growth potential over a sputtering balance sheet. He called it the Tesla factor, referring to the U.S. EV company that was able to pull itself from deficit into growth after listing on America's tech-heavy Nasdaq, noting that would not have been possible with current rules governing the Kazakh. Im said he plans to allow IPOs for a company that has struggled under R&D costs but possesses strong business potential. The FSC is set to announce a final plan within the month. And to tell us more about last week and this week's stock market action, we have our Business Daily's Markets contributor, Che jin Sok joining us on the phone today. Hello, jin Sok. Thanks for having me, Jia. So let's get started by looking at the Korean stock market. Tell us how things went last week. All right. On Friday, the Cosby rose by 0.28% to close at 2038.31, while the cost stock surged by 0.8% to close at 
The Kospi market fell mostly during the early hours, but rebounded sharply as oil prices started to pick up. Lower expectations of a potential U.S. interest rate high thanks to sluggish U.S. manufacturing data helped foreign investors buy massive amounts of shares on the market as well. By sector, shipping, machinery, and IT led the rally on the heavyweight index. On a weekly basis, the Kospi didn't move much, closing up by just 0.04%. Mixed signals regarding the U.S. rate hike had heightened volatility in global equity markets. But weak economic indicators in the U.S. and rising oil prices prevented the market from falling into correction last week. Then, Jin Suk, how did the Korean stock market close on the first day of this week? We saw Hanjin Shipping's shares plummet on the first day after resuming trading. You're right. Hanjin saw its shares nosedive by over 13 percent. Its shares opened nearly 23 percent down before inching back up. The Korean equity market overall finished strong on the first session of the week. The Kospi surged by more than 1% to close as 2060, while the Kostab rose by 0.3% to close just below 680. Lower expectations of a potential rate hike in the U.S. continue to boost investor confidence. Both foreigners and institutional investors bought massive amounts of shares to lift the index. By sectors, however, cosmetics and entertainment performed relatively weak due to concerns over a sharp protest from Beijing on the decision to deploy the terminal high-altitude area defense system. These sectors are heavily dependent on consumers in China. And Jin Seok, we saw some disappointing figures from Friday's U.S. employment report, which ironically seemed to have eased fears among investors. What's the outlook now for an imminent rate hike from the Fed and what other indicators are there to look out for this week? Remember, according to that jobs report, the U.S. labor market created just 151,000 jobs last month, missing market expectations of more than 180,000. After, re- uh, after the release, CME Fed Watch, a futures market betting on rate hikes, now sees just above a 10% possibility of a rate hike in September, compared to 27% before the report. Expectations for a hike in December fell from 57% to 51% as well. Considering this, investors will want to take a close look at the Fed. Facebook set for release on Wednesday local time, which is used as one of the references for policy decisions. Oil prices can be another important factor relating to inflation trends in the U.S. But excess intermediate or WTI prices sank by about 7 percent last week, raising concerns of supply gluts in the global oil market as well as slowdown in inflation. A rebound in oil prices and its implications for Fed policies will be eyed throughout this week. I mean, the central bank would, uh, the Korea central bank would also be eyeing uh, that and uh, because it's holding a monthly monetary policy meeting this week. Uh, But over in Europe, the ECB will also hold its policy meeting this week. Are there any expectations for additional stimulus measures over there? Actually, the uh, Financial Times or FT gave three possible scenarios. First, the ECB might extend its asset purchase program by six months. The central bank could also change its quantitative easing or QE policy mix. Lastly, the ECB may keep its current program on hold. Most experts expect ECB President Mario Draghi to promise market participants another round of stimulus measures verbally at the press conference on Thursday. Since core inflation in the euro area fell for the first time in three months last month, expectations for additional measures have been surging. The meeting results are expected to have an impact on various asset markets. This has been Chai Jin-seok for Business Daily.
Samsung Electronics has announced it will no longer use batteries supplied by its sister firms, Samsung SDI, for its latest flagship smartphone, Galaxy Note 7. This comes after reports suggest the tech giant may spend as much as $1 billion in a recall of 2.5 million Note 7 phones shipped out since going on sale two weeks ago. Samsung said it will expand orders from the Chinese battery maker ATI instead and add another supplier for the time being. Shares of Samsung SDI plunged roughly 6% last week on speculation that its faulty batteries may have caused a series of overheating and explosions. Ultra high definition television, also known as UHD, is a digital video format that delivers four times as much detail as a full HD. With its advanced technology, Korea is on track to lead this market, which is set to become the new future standard. Park Se-young tells us more. When UHD TVs go on the market next February, Korea is expected to dominate just as it has with digital TV. Korean researchers have developed key technologies for UHD broadcasts which offer high-quality images and they're set to become the global standard. The domestic technology for UHD broadcasting grants us technical superiority. The technology is also expected to bring in revenue from royalties. One of the technologies facilitates the distribution of content to multiple channels and objects. Another allows for compression of four times as much audio and video data as existing methods. Both technologies will be essential to the latest mobile TV and digital multimedia broadcasting services that allow users to stream programs and podcasts on their phones and other devices no matter where they are. Improved UHD content can be watched indoors, and anyone traveling at over 100 kilometers an hour can have access to full HD video. The key technologies are expected to be applied to the next generation of our televisions, opening new opportunities for the related local industries. Park Se-young, Business Daily. Balancing paychecks can be tricky. People often find themselves trying to figure out how much to spend and how much to put away. Big data analysis from one of Korea's major banks shows just how big a struggle this is when it comes to workers in their 30s and 40s. Our Lee ji has more. It's that time of the month, arguably the day workers most look forward to, payday. Before employees in Korea, the joy is said to be short-lived. According to a year-long big data analysis of 1.5 million workers in their 30s and 40s, a major local bank, Shinan Bank, discovered that credit card payments were eating up roughly 45 percent of people's monthly salaries, while 17 percent accounted for debit card expenses. That means card payments alone took up 62 percent of people's monthly incomes. With more than half of their salaries being drained from their accounts, Korean workers are left with less to save. Only 11 percent went to investment or savings, which is about $393 on average. But the bank says those who put away under 300,000 won, or $270 a month, were some 70 percent of all workers, meaning it could take anywhere up to 19 years to save up 100 million won, or around $90,000. The Financial Supervisory Service says the average paycheck of employees working for the country's top 30 companies only grew by a minuscule 0.4 percent in the first half of this year compared to the same time last year. This is in stark contrast to the near 6 percent rise in the average pay of employees just a year ago. Experts warn tepid growth in worker salaries will put a dent in spending eventually leading to a possible deflation down the line. Lee Ju-young, Business Daily. Korea's peer-to-peer lending sector has seen rapid growth this year, with startups capitalizing on an opportunity in the country's lending environment. This as the government takes another step toward nurturing its fintech ecosystem. Eunice Kim has more. The world's first fintech open platform was unveiled last week. It's designed to standardize financial transaction programs across Korea's banks and securities firms, with the goal of ultimately turning up the competitiveness of the sleepy banking industry via financial technology. 
Already, an area of noticeable growth has been in P2P lending. P2P or peer-to-peer -peer lending directly connects a would-be borrower to an individual lender through a mobile application, which facilitates the loan and interest payment transactions. Money that exchanges hands through P2P platforms has skyrocketed this year. P2P loans had only accounted for $31 million at the end of 2015, but that figure multiplied by more than five times as of the end of July to $170 million, as more startups joined in on what could be a lucrative opportunity. P2P lending has seen soaring growth in markets like the U.S. and the U.K., and some say Korea is a particularly good fit, as the current lending environment is hostile to those with a subpar credit score. P2P lenders consider more than credit ratings and generally offer a lower rate than existing non-bank lenders. But it's also an area that's experiencing growing pains. A recent survey by Korea Consumer Agency found that less than half of P2P borrowers were satisfied with the service, citing a still high interest rate and the lack of information as top reasons. For investors who took home an average net return of 10% over two years, it's also a risk. There are virtually no laws determining how much of that risk is taken by the P2P lending firm and how much of it falls under an exemption. The Financial Services Commission plans to release a guideline next month that addresses investor protection and specifies financing limitations, though the government will need to go further to build a legal framework for this fast-growing fintech sector. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. And that's it for this edition of Business Daily. Hope you've enjoyed it. I'm Hong Jie. Do stay tuned to Arirang News coming up at 6 p.m. Korea time. Goodbye for now.